The man thinks for a moment. How much do you think they spend on other countries on their 4th of July parades? I bite my tongue. No, don't respond. Don't say the obvious. Just exit and get to your car. Hello, I'm Ryan Wendell. Welcome to the first episode of Voices of the Valley. What I just read was an excerpt from Close Encounters of a Chicago Kind, a new book by Moraine alum Vicki Quaddy. Vicki Quaddy is a former reporter and editor for Moraine's newspaper, The Glacier. She is a Chicago journalist, playwright, producer, and performer who is best known for her interactive comedy show, Late Night Catechism, one of the longest running shows in Chicago theater. With her new book, Close Encounters of a Chicago Kind, Vicki has decided to add author to her long list of titles. I am honored to have the chance to speak today with Vicki about her book, her time at Moraine, and how life has been for her as a performer during this pandemic. So, hello, Vicki, how are you? Hi, Ryan. Oh, I'm fine. Thank you. Thank you. So your book, I was reading a little bit of it the other day, and it just is so interesting the way you bring all these stories of Chicago to life. I was just wondering, what was some of your inspirations to write this book? Oh, well, um, the book is primarily based on Facebook posts that I've made over the past really like 10 years. Um, And so many people over the years have said, we love your, your little vignettes. You should collect those in a book. Um, but I've always been really busy. I mean, I have a really busy life. Um, but I was, I had created a new show called Easter Bunny Bingo. And it was going to open at the Royal George Theater in Chicago uh, in March of 2020. Well, something else happened in <laughs> 2020 as well. Um, but in, in, we actually did open for one weekend. And uh, in promoting that show, I got on um, a, a, a podcast um, by these two guys, uh, Rick, uh, Rick Camfer and David Stern, and I looked them up, and they owned a printing house, uh, a publishing house called Eckhart's Press. And I just, I just tossed out the idea, hey, people have told me all along that I should do this book. What do you think? And um, and they read some of the raw material and said, yeah, this is great. And I thought, when am I going to have time to do this? Well, I had plenty of time. So that was one of my uh, projects during the pandemic was to download my entire Facebook, (laughs) call through it. You can download everyone. I don't know if people know that, but you can download your entire Facebook, go through it. I edited out what I didn't want. And then I put together... um, the, the ones I wanted to keep, and then I had to organize it. So it was a process to do it. Um, but I was really happy with how it turned out. And then uh, my, my friend Michael Miller did all the illustrations. He did the cover, and he did all the interior illustrations. And so it, it really just came together. Yeah. So in a press release, oh, excuse me, it says that Close Encounters of the Chicago Kind is a compilation of stories examining the lives that brush past you on the city streets in banks, at grocery stores, or in restaurants. Right. So do you have a favorite story or a couple of favorite stories that you have in this book that you think people would be interested in about? Oh, oh yeah. Uh, I, I'm sorry. I should have had the book with me. Um, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, I, I love a lot of the vignettes, of course. Um, I think the, the first vignette is set at, uh, at Chase Bank, and it involves a woman who has come in to take out a sizable amount of money. Um, and uh, I, I, I think it's kind of a fascinating look at not only what you hear at a bank, but also the kinds of things that um, happen in someone's life. Um, so the, the woman was going through a really bitter divorce. She was living on the cash economy and she was taking out, if I remember correctly, something like $30,000 in cash that she wanted to be put into a bag that she was going to take home. Um, and then for whatever reason, she just turned to me and started talking. Um, and uh, it's moments like that, that you just think, this is great. I'm going to make note of this. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously you did write this book because of COVID-19. How was the process like for you writing this book in a pandemic? Like, were there any challenges that you faced? Sure. The challenges are that you're alone. Um, and uh, uh, even though I have uh, I have kids, I have a support system, I have friends. Really, it was being alone and taking a look at it 
and trying to figure out what the book was, to be honest, um, until I was talking to a friend of mine and he said to me, well, what he, he said, he said, describe the book. And I said, oh, I don't know. It's like a day in the life of Vicky Quaddy. You know, I go to the bank and I go to the post office and I, I'm going to travel. And, and that was it. That's all I needed was to have one person say, what is it? And then I thought, yes, that's when I decided it, it had to be at the bank, at the post office, uh, on the streets, traveling, um, being in danger. Um, and the danger story is interesting. Uh, yeah. The danger story, and there's a few danger stories, but my favorite danger story was when I was performing at the Hard Rock Cafe. Um, and, uh, oh, good. In fact, my assistant, my son, has just brought me my book. <laughs> um, but the Hard Rock uh, uh, Cafe um, in, in Biloxi, Mississippi. And I just happened, because people smoke still in cafes, uh, in um, uh, casinos. And I... Uh, and so I went for a walk and I went for a walk down by the water and I happened to spot and witness a drug deal. Um, it was a, a 20 something guy um, and, uh, and two kids. Those kids were only about 14, 15 years old, maybe 16. They were no older than that on, on bicycles. And they clearly were buying pot or something. Um, but uh, they came over to find out who I was. And in the course of, of the conversation with the with the dealer, um, the gun fell out of of his backpack. I guess <laughs> it now, but to to watch a gun fall out right in front of you, and you're like, this kid knows that I just witnessed this drug deal. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so there was a moment where it was a little it was a little difficult. Um, but I took hold of it and. Uh, started talking to him, and it turns out he loves improv and comedy and wants to be a performer. And that was it. Once I knew that he was, he was, you know, in my, in my clutches, then I could manipulate that uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and truly save my life. Yeah. So just talk about a little bit of your performing background. Where did you get your start? Like, what made you want to be a performer? Oh, my goodness. I, uh, you know, it really starts young. Um, mm -hmm. I can remember uh, having to babysit my little brother. So he was two years old. I was eight. And I was uh, creating stories um, and and basically performing them for him. Um, and uh, uh, and so I loved, I loved the uh, spoken word and I loved the written word. Mm -hmm. And I went into journalism um, because I really did have a knack for not only telling stories, but collecting information. I'm really good at research. I'm good at talking to people. And that's, those are skills that, and I'm a good writer. So those are skills that segue really well into journalism. Um, but never in my life did I think that I would see the ending of two institutions, one of them being nuns, um, that there aren't that many nuns any longer in the world. Uh, and the other one being daily newspapers that you can hold in your hand and read. Uh, with large newsrooms and large staffs. Um, so uh, it, to me, it's kind of fascinating that I have lived through uh, not the demise, but certainly, um, you know, a, a cha major changes in those two. Um, so as I mentioned prior, you were a Moraine alum. How was your time like at Moraine? Like, do you have any fun stories from Moraine or anything that you would want to share? Sure, I love Moraine Valley. Um, it, you know, if Moraine Valley had been a four-year college, I would have stayed there all four years. Um, it uh, it was a breath of fresh air, uh, of ideas, sharing ideas. I had great instructors. Um, and, uh, of course, the campus barely existed. I mean, it was mostly huts. I, I like, you know, tr imagine, you know, trailers that we had our classrooms in. And then there were the two buildings, which I think are now called is it 1A and 1B? I forget what they're called now. Um, at the buildings, you're just like called A, B now. So yeah. they're just letters right now. Right, exactly. Well, those are the only two buildings on the campus. Um, and, uh, um, and so I uh, would walk to those buildings from the parking lot and uh, have classes there and then have classes in the little huts. Um, and it was just great. I mean, it, it, it was a real, uh, a real chance for me to... Um, 
to really learn my journalism craft. So again, you were a writer and reporter for The Glacier, and that's something that I've had the chance to do. How was writing and editing for The Glacier inspire you? Like, did it really make you passionate about wanting to go into the journalism field? Yes. Well, I was at that point, I was in the journalism field. Um, and um, uh, I started out as a writer. And um, and then I ended up um, getting a job uh, at the um, Star Tribune, uh, which was in uh, Orland, Oak Park, and Tinley Park. Uh, and so I, I, as a student, I got that job and, uh, it was not a full-time job. It was just a, I was a freelancer, but I did a lot of work for them. So I was writing for the glacier, I was writing for them. And, um, uh, and then in my sophomore year, I became the first female editor of the glacier. Um, and I always tell the story and I don't, I don't mean it to sound bitter, but, um, I, I think, you know, I was part of that group of women that were really just making inroads and the powers that be um, at the college and at the newspaper. I don't know that they trusted a female editor. And so they had me be a co-editor with our photographer, who's a wonderful guy. His name is Jeff Paz. Um and he was, uh, and we were co-editors, but basically I was doing all the work and Jeff was taking the photos, which was, you know, he's a wonderful photographer. Um, but I was really the person who had the, the writing and editing skills. Um, and, uh, and I, I have been asked on occasion to remember those years. And I always think to myself, can you imagine if you were, if you were hired to be uh, the, the head of a bank. But they, they thought, a woman, a woman head. I don't know about that. We better put a man with her. Um, and, uh, but, but that's what happened. So I am a co-editor of the commission, but the first female editor. And that, that is very, I did not know that. And that's very interesting to know. And I think you would know that a lot of the people who run the place right now are women. So maybe you were like the, <laughs> the gateway into like, you know, leading that change. I, I, so, hope, I, I hope that's true. Yeah, it's a it's a really I really do love the glacier. Um, do you have any advice for Moraine students who would want to go into the field of journalism or acting, perhaps? Oh, it has to be a passion. You can't just do it because you think, oh, I'm going to try this out. Um, I I knew from a very young age that I wanted to write, that I had those skills, um, and uh, and I went into journalism because of that. I segued into theater in a real natural way, because I was doing, um, I was doing Q and A's um, uh, for uh, the American Bar Association. And I would do them for an occasional other publication. And it's, it, went, it was very easy for me to segue from um, uh, working with the spoken word to creating the spoken word. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, those were really passions of mine. And um, uh, I, while I while I'm good at other things, I think that I went into the right fields. Um, so I think if somebody today wants to be a journalist, that's wonderful. I mean, we need really skilled journalists. Um, and I would say that you need I mean, a, a writer writes, a journalist uh, works, uh, and, and so find a publication, find an online source. Um, and just you know, introduce yourself and introduce your writing and start to do that. In terms of journalism, in terms of acting, it's kind of the same thing. It's like get involved with a, an acting group uh, or start your own. I mean, a lot of people start their own, um, but the idea is to get in front of an audience um, and uh, and get get those initial jitters out of the way. Um, and then you learn. You learn. You learn timing. Uh, and you learn, well, you learn when to pause, and and you learn what doesn't work, um, and and you learn how to develop uh, a, a piece. So, uh, but both of those are really just getting out there and doing it. And I know some people may say, "Oh, that's simple. That's easy for you to say." No, you can do it. You know, you can find a troop. You can get involved in some way, even if it's your a, a community theater, even if it's. Uh, uh, you know, something on campus, um, 
And in terms of writing for publication, there are there are online publications that you could start with. Uh, or start your own blog. I mean, really, you you can do things. So, um, have you happened to do any theater at Moraine, or did you find theater kind of after you had already left Moraine? Oh no, I found theater way later. Um, uh -huh. I uh, uh I segued into theater um uh, in in the nineties, um, which was like a thousand years ago now. Um, <laughs> but um, and then I stayed in journalism. I I, I finally went full time into theater. Somewhere around 2000, I suppose. So obviously, I am, I was, I am, was kind of a performer in like the, but then the pandemic hit, and then I'm like, oh goodness. So I just want to know, what is, how has life changed for you being a performer in this pandemic? Like, how, like, has it put a halt to everything? No, I've done some Zoom things, but, um, and I, and we filmed some streaming uh, performances, and I've had those. Uh, available online. The thing is, though, when you're when you're doing a Zoom, like right now, I'm talking to you. So if I say something funny and you laugh, that's great. You know, that's feedback for me. But if I'm doing a Zoom, and, and and a lot of places that I've done Zooms for, they just want you to film it, and they're going to insert it into something that they're doing. Um, and uh, uh, and so there's no feedback. So that's the oddest thing is to perform with absolutely no audience. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then you just hope, like you call later and say, how was it? Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't know. Uh, so uh, so that's been difficult. Um, and also the idea of staying fresh. You know, sometimes I run my, my uh, scripts through my head so, so I can remember them. So when the time comes, I can get back on stage and do them and not be like, what, what's the next bit? <laughs> what am I supposed to be doing? So um, it's staying fresh. Um, and it's getting the public to remember you so that when the time comes, they're like, oh, yeah, those shows, we want to see that. Um, but it's really, and it's, it's having absolutely no income um, for, uh, for the shows. Uh, I mean, even the, the little tiny bit uh, that I do of streaming and Zoom, it's... <sighs> It's maybe one tenth of a, a normal yearly income for my company, um, and uh, and and that I think for all companies, for all theater, for music venues, um, I mean that has been it's, it's been devastating. Um. So your show Late Night Catechism is very interesting. And what was the thought process of the show and creating the show? Oh, boy, the show. Uh, it goes back to 1993, um, and it was created as a a little one-hour bit of entertainment. But um, but late night catechism started as um, a uh, uh, just a little. It's not supposed to be six weeks. It was not supposed to be very long. Uh, so so it was just supposed to be a little one-hour bit of entertainment, and uh, it ended up turning into this phenomenon. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and, uh, and really, it was, it was it is a play of its time. Um, you know, it was the 90s. It was 1993. Um, remember when people had money? Uh, people have not had that kind of money in a long time. Uh, the, I, I call it most of the good years. Um, and uh, uh, one person showed very common and uh, people liked them. They were very popular. So, um, and uh, nobody had really done what we did, the, the presentation of a, of a nun character as a real, not a singing, dancing, not an angry nun, but a, but a real person to really put the audience back to their childhood memories. Um, and, 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 and when people ask me, why does this show last as long as it does? I think that I think it brings people right back to their childhood um, in, in a good way. Um, so do you have any future plans for the show Late Night Catechism? Like, do you think that possibly, hopefully very soon, you're going to be back with an audience with it? Yes. Oh, yeah, it'll it'll reopen. It'll reopen once it's safe to reopen. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we have to we have to watch the numbers. We have to make sure that people are getting vaccinated. We have to we have to urge people to get vaccinated. Um, I believe right now, uh, 
Oh, I, I have been vaccinated, and I believe all my actresses have, and my stage managers are getting vaccinated. So we will be all right. So then it's a matter of reaching out to our audience, um, and hopefully we will finish the coming back. Um, so again, just a little bit going kind of back to your book. Um, someone described, um, Dan Rose, he described you as an oddity magnet. Um, do you think that's an accurate depiction of who you are as a person? Oh, you know, Don Rose knows me pretty well. Um, it isn't that I'm a man for odd people, but that I'm open to talking to anybody. Um, and that includes odd people. Um, so, uh, um, so yes, uh, and, and I see things that perhaps other people don't see so readily. I've had a lot of people say, I go to the bank, nothing ever happened. Well, it might if you listened or if you saw something happening and just waited a bit to see it develop. Um, or you're on the street or you were in your car or whatever, you know, you overhear something. Um, and I think, um, I think that's a skill that I have. Uh -huh. um, so also just one more question. Where can listeners, where are they able to buy your book? Do you have like any way they can get it? Yes, um, they have to buy it online. I think at Eckhart Press. Um, that's another um, that's that's another issue involved uh, with the pandemic. Is that normally I'd be first, and I'd be doing book signings and reading and things like that. And a lot of the bookstores aren't really open yet for that, um, yeah. but they will be. And when they are, I, I hope to get into um, many of them. Um, I also plan to have the book available at the theater once we reopen, because that's a logical place to have it. Um, and the big thing is I'd like to take about, I'm going to say about 15, maybe 20 of the vignettes, but a solid 15, and turn them into a performance piece. Um, because I think they're very, um, they're very visual. And I think uh, having someone performing them on stage um, would work really well. So that's another little project I'm going to be working on. Mm -hmm. um, now that things are finally starting to get back to normal and things are opening back up, what are you looking forward to most about getting, to, you know, past this pandemic and going back into your beloved Chicago? Oh, well, I've already started hugging people, so that's good. Um, I have not really gone into a restaurant for like a full meal. Um, so I'd like to do that and meet friends at a restaurant. Um, I have yet to really go into um, a major museum, um, so I want to be able to do that. I mean, I have been vaccinated, but I'm still being careful. Um, mm -hmm. Not everyone's being vaccinated, so. Um, but uh, it's really just getting back into the city. I mean, Chicago's a wonderful city. Traveling, I mean, the idea of, uh, I mean, I travel a lot and perform. I have a whole line of bingo shows we haven't really talked about. But uh, the the sort of the mother superior of that is is my my Bible bingo show, and I I do that. I, I go out of town maybe I don't know maybe thirty times a year, um, and I will go to all, all over. I, back in two thousand nineteen, I was invited to go to Singapore, oh. um, and I did two major fundraisers in Singapore, um, and then uh, just a couple years before that, I was invited to Guam, and I did. Um, I did two performances and then I came back and did three performances. Um, so I do, I mean, I really do travel just all over the place. Uh, and I'm looking forward to getting back to doing that. Yeah. Um, do you have any like little fun places in Chicago that maybe people haven't heard of and you want people to know about? Fun places. <laughs> There's a ton of stuff in Chicago. <laughs> It really just depends on what you want. Uh, you know, if you like blues, there's great blues. But it really, it's, it depends on what's reopening. Yeah. A lot of stuff that I might say, oh, yeah, this is great. It may not be reopening. Um, so uh, I, mean, I, I, I think at this point, people just have to figure out um, what they can support. And yeah. There are still really wonderful restaurants. The, the museums are all going to reopen. Um, that's, that's no doubt. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's just gems all over the city. Um, and I, and I think people just have to figure out what's, again, what's open. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Well, I just want to thank you so much for talking with me today in Moraine's first ever Voices of the Valley. Um, yep. The new book is Close Encounters of a Chicago Kind, where she writes about her experience with people in the city that we love so dearly. Um, if you want more information on Vicki, you can go to her website, nunsforfun.com. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ryan Wendell, and have a good day. Thank you, Ryan. Take care. So much. Thank you.